Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome to another one of our webinars. Now, I just wanted to also bring you up to speed with some updates that we're doing on our uh, Honda CRX. And this is an EF CRX that we purchased last year, I think it was. And it was uh, powered by a fairly healthy built Honda K20 running uh, individual throttle bodies, uh, producing around about 255 wheel horsepower, I think from memory. And it's a great little package it's very very fast uh, because it doesn't weigh too much. What we did find though is that inheriting or purchasing uh, an existing race car that's had a pretty long life meant that once we actually got the wrap off it, it was a little bit beat up and wasn't quite looking as sharp as we wanted it to. Uh, on top of that, we found out that while the EF generation Honda CRX is incredibly light, this comes with its own downsides. The reason it's light is because the bodywork is essentially paper thin. And when you start putting a, a fairly spicy two litre engine in the front of it and you start driving it really hard around racetracks, cracks start appearing in places that you don't really want cracks, which is essentially anywhere in your chassis. Uh, so on the, over the off season before we get into our endurance series later in the year, uh, we took the opportunity to give this a little bit of a birthday, a bit of a freshen up. So it's currently getting panelled and painted. Uh, we've gone through and welded up all of the cracks. And at the same time, while that's being done, we are in the market for a little bit more power because, you know, why wouldn't you want a little bit more power? So there's a few things we are doing I just wanted to talk about. One of those is we are upgrading the ECU. So get under our overhead here. Uh, the car was already running an Mtron ECU. It was running the SL4 as its name implies, uh, really ideally suited to four cylinder operation. And it is a four cylinder, so on face value that seems like a great idea. However, there are a few things that we did want to do with this uh, that don't really lend itself too well to the SL4. Uh, one of them, and if we can just jump across to my laptop screen, one of them that I've, I've been wanting to try for years and I've just not had the opportunity is to mount a set of injectors outside of the intake trumpet. So we can kind of see uh, this here on a Formula One engine. Uh, the Formula One engines only ran one set of injectors like this, obviously of this era, a uh, bit of old school technology now with direct injection. Uh, but the, inlet, the injectors are up above the inlet trumpet. So the theory here is that this can promote uh, better mixture preparation and we can potentially see uh, a little bit of a gain in power compared to just a single set of injectors mounted down in the factory location down by the inlet valve. So pros and cons of the two locations and what we wanted to do was try this out and see if there was any power to be had and again this is uh, on my laptop screen here uh, an example of what that can look like. Uh, we're running a set of Gen V individual throttle bodies on the K20 so that's not what this is but for all intents and purposes the same so we've got a, a set of factory oh not factory injectors we've got a set of injectors mounted down by the header flange just like this and what I wanted to do was try mounting a second set of injectors outside of the trumpets like this the reason that we wanted to try the two sets like this is so that we can stage them in and out depending on RPM and also throttle position uh, because most of you would probably be able to understand that a set of injectors mounted outside of the inlet trumpets is not going to make for great uh, idle quality when the butterflies are essentially closed. They're going to be spraying against that butterfly and basically the, the fuel is going to wet out against the butterfly and then sort of drip into the uh, intake port. Uh, However, this set of injectors mounted outside of the trumpets will work quite nicely, or at least should work quite nicely at higher throttle openings and of course higher RPM. So remains to be seen if there is going to be any benefit. We'll be documenting this as we go so you can get to learn from our expense. But in order to do that, among other things, it did require a step up to the KV-8. The KV-8 as its name would suggest is really ideally suited for eight cylinder engines. So it comes with eight injector drive 
drives and it comes with eight ignition drives. So definitely a little bit of overkill for our application but there are a few other things that we're going to be doing on this as well. In the moment the uh, throttles are actuated by cable and we'll be switching this to drive by wire. Genvy make a nice little drive by wire motor suited to their uh, ITB setups with a nice little mount so it all becomes pretty seamless to do. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we also are going to be fitting a Hollinger sequential gearbox. So um, the moment the gearbox in it is the stock six-speed Honda K-Series box. It is running a Gear X close ratio gear set and an LSD. So nothing p particularly over the top there, pretty normal stuff. We have had nothing but reliability problems with this gearbox though and it's been quite frustrating to the point where uh, the last time Ben raced the car uh, within the course of about three uh, outings on the track had managed to uh, maybe make second gear a little bit hit and miss. Now I will say that uh, he's not here to defend himself but I can say this, I think it might be a little bit due to Ben's driving style uh, but that's what we're dealing with here. So what we wanted to do is put something that's going to be a little bit stronger and hopefully a lot more reliable. We've had amazing results with the SG3 Hollinger gearbox that is in our other, our, our Toyota 8.6. Uh, we've done a full season of, of endurance racing on that. We pulled it apart at the end of the season. It honestly looked just like brand new. We cleaned it up and put it back together. There was no need to do anything to it, which is exactly what you want when you're dealing with gearboxes. Uh, and we jump across to my laptop screen. This is the Hollinger SF gearbox. It is a uh, universal uh, six-speed transverse transaxle gearbox. Includes uh, a final drive and a differential in it. So it is universal. Uh, Hollinger have previously fitted these to the K20 engine though. So they've actually got a bell housing which kind of all makes this a, a bolt-in operation. So that's the gearbox upgrade that we're going for. Allows us to get some slightly uh, better designed ratios for uh, the engine as well, which should give us a little bit of an advantage. But really, this is more about reliability. The only element I will mention here is in our Toyota 86, we are running the SG3 as a paddle shifted gearbox with uh, paddles on the steering wheels, and it's all actuated via compressed air. Nice thing about this is that it takes a lot of the driver input out of the equation. What I mean by this is the shift is really controlled by the ECU. When the driver pulls the paddle to upshift, the ECU will bring in a torque, uh, torque reduction. So this can be as a combination of fuel cut, ignition cut, or both. So that allows the dogs in the gearbox to disengage, which is important because we need to do that so that the next gear can be engaged. Then the air actuator will move the uh, selector into the next gear and it is closed loop which means that the ECU is monitoring the feedback from the gear position sensor and it doesn't reintroduce engine torque until it knows that the next gear is engaged. Nice thing about this is that it's almost impossible to stuff up a shift. All you have to do is pull the lever and really the ECU and the electronics does the hard work for you. Uh, on the downshift the opposite really occurs and uh, this time the ECU will also blip the throttle via the drive-by wire meaning that the driver doesn't need to use the clutch for upshifts or downshifts. The driver can left foot brake, don't, we don't need to manually heel and toe blip uh, to match revs on the downshift. So it takes uh, a lot of that driver involvement out of it and the result is what I mentioned, we pulled that gearbox apart after a full season of endurance racing and it looked like brand new. However, to make the CRX a, a little bit more sort of uh, involving to drive I guess would be one way of describing it, we really wanted to retain a lever in this car and when you've got a lever attached to the gearbox this does bring a bit more of the driver skill into it as well uh, because with a dog engagement gearbox uh, if you shift them too slowly uh, you can end up damaging the dogs in that way so hopefully we can get Ben up to speed with pulling that lever nice and aggressively making sure that the shifts are nice and quick, clean and all of the dogs stay intact uh, but that will all be controlled via the Mtron KV8 as well and as a worst case scenario if we really do continue to have trouble we've got enough spare IO on the KV8 uh, that we can switch to a paddle shift arrangement if we absolutely have to but 
I'm pretty confident that we can get away without going down that path. Uh, some other changes that we are doing to get a little bit more power hopefully out of the engine, we're actually building a spare engine which will be documented in our practical engine building course. Uh, so if you are interested in learning how to build a K-series engine, uh, that will be coming up. Uh, that's probably a couple of months away though, so don't get too excited just yet. Uh, I will just mention how that course works. Our practical engine building course, as its name suggests, will teach you how to build your own engines. And uh, I know that a lot of enthusiasts are prepared to take on just about any jobs on their own project cars, but think that building engines is beyond them. The reality is that uh, it's actually not that difficult. And anyone with a good uh, amount of patience and an eye for detail can build their own engines at home. The other misconception is people think that you need tens of thousands of dollars worth of specialist tools to build engines. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. As long as you're already equipped with your normal mechanics tool set, so I'm talking here uh, socket sets, screwdrivers, ring spanners, that sort of thing, uh, really the additional tools you'll need over and above that, it's not that great and it doesn't have to be a massive investment. And one of the reasons we can get away with this is that we're going to be relying on a, a separate engine machinist or engine reconditioner to do the actual machining work on our hard parts. That's definitely something that the home enthusiast is not going to be able to do. So this course breaks the entire engine building process down into the HPA 10 step process. And by doing this, each of the individual steps in the process is relatively quick and easy to complete. And in no time, you've got a completely built engine. Uh, you know that you've got all of the parts correctly installed, all of the tolerances and clearances inside are exactly where they need to be, meaning that when it comes time to start the engine for the first time, you have the confidence that everything's going to work just like it should. The engine's going to deliver great power, great torque, and most importantly, great reliability. Now, the course is generic, meaning you can apply it irrespective of what engine you want to build, maybe a quad cam V12, maybe a Honda K20, uh, maybe a pushrod LS V8, it doesn't matter. But once you get through the body of the course, we then move into our library of worked examples, which is an informal walkthrough of that 10-step process where you can watch it being applied from start to finish on a real engine building job. And that K20 worked example is going to go in there once it's finished. Uh, if you want to learn more about that course you can check it out at hpacademy.com forward slash courses and with all of our courses that have a practical element we do add these worked examples to them from time to time uh, once you own the course there's no additional charge for any extra worked examples so the course kind of continues to grow with you so with that a uh, couple of small things these k20 engines are really really good straight off the showroom floor so uh, the, it's difficult to find significant gains and particularly when we're already dealing with uh, a built engine in the car that's already putting out really good power uh, trying to find improvements over that we're starting to get into the the sort of subtleties of improving the performance so uh, some of the things we're going to be looking at is getting a little bit more compression into the engine uh, we will be fitting a CNC ported head uh, we're going to try a couple of different cam profiles, see if we can get some gains there. And there are a few other subtle aspects as well. So nothing particularly earth shattering. One aspect that I am going to show you here is the clutch. And this is something that's often overlooked. So uh, I'll just get our first clutch under our overhead here. Uh, so this is a quarter master seven and a quarter inch twin plate clutch so this actually is off our Toyota 86 but you can see uh, the size of that clutch uh, in saying that the current clutch that's in the Honda CRX is actually a factory style single plate clutch uh, it's a puck style clutch with a much larger uh, diameter pressure plate than even what we've got here with this twin plate so it's pretty common when we're building a performance engine to fit a lightweight flywheel and that's kind of one of those go-to modifications that probably people don't really actually understand what it's doing. So the weight of the flywheel, losing weight out of any part of a race car is obviously valuable, but uh, when we're losing weight out of a rotating part of the engine, what it can do is allow the engine to change its RPM faster. In other words, the engine can rev quicker. Uh, there's two elements to this. There's the mass of the rotating assembly, 
Uh, in this case, we're talking obviously clutch and flywheel. But there's also the moment of inertia, which is essentially whereabouts that mass is located. So if the mass is located far away from the center line of the crankshaft, this is actually the worst case scenario because uh, that mass located a long way from the flywheel makes it harder for us to change the engine speed. So what we want to do is reduce the mass, but also get what mass there is closest as close as we can to the center line of the crankshaft. And in order to help us with that, uh, I'll just get this other, well, this is what it is here. This is a uh, five and a half inch twin plate clutch. So let's get it under our overhead. Uh, this is actually a used item. This is a Saks clutch out of a Porsche Cup car from memory. Uh, so what we're doing is getting a custom flywheel made uh, that will mount up this smaller diameter clutch uh, and the advantages here over what we've got, we've calculated we should be able to lose about two kilograms out of the entire mass. But again, the moment of inertia has reduced that mass of the clutch instead of being all the way out here on a seven and a quarter inch is now closer to the center line of the clutch. So we're reducing the moment of inertia as well. So uh, one of those things that is a little bit harder to quantify because we aren't going to see the result of this uh, show up on a dyno in terms of more power. The engine isn't making more power, but it is able to accelerate quicker. And whether that's a free rev, which will obviously help with rev match on downshifts or just physically able to accelerate faster through a gear uh, it's all uh, good stuff that we would like to have in our Honda CRX once it's back up and running so again uh, we'll bring a little bit more information about that as we go um, other element with that Mtron that I wanted to mention, uh, the SL4 that we've currently got doesn't have on board Lambda, uh, we are running an external CAM based Lambda controller pretty common these days, no big big deal. Uh, the KV8 actually has dual onboard Lambda built into it, so it'll, it'll run uh, two LSU 4.9 Lambda sensors on board. Uh, that's obviously not necessary on a four cylinder, but because we're going to be trying to push the, the limits with this engine as much as we can, uh, at some point we may investigate putting individual cylinder Lambda on it basically a lander sensor on each each exhaust primary header and this will allow us to tune each its individual cylinder. How that would work with the KV8 is two of the sensors would be wired directly to the ECU and would bring in another two through a Cantor Lambda unit. And this can uh, offer sometimes relatively significant improvements in performance. It really comes down to uh, what the existing uh, mixture preparation is like uh, per cylinder. The reason this comes into play is because when we're tuning an engine conventionally, we'll use one single lambda sensor that will be mounted in the exhaust after the collector. And what that's really giving us is a bit of a report on the average air fuel ratio of all of the cylinders. So this could easily be a situation where we have one or maybe two cylinders that are a touch lean. But if we've also got one or two cylinders that are a touch rich, they kind of even out and our overall reported lander is going to be on our target. Now that's not necessarily a problem but as we start pushing the limits and we start getting a little bit closer to the ragged edge with our tuning, uh, that can be enough to potentially damage the cylinders that are running a little bit lean and really there also can be some performance benefit in terms of getting the air fuel ratio equalized across all of the cylinders. So again, uh, we'll report back and see how we get on with that. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.